welcome Riverbend back to some semblance of normalcy. Have uh, a few announcements tonight. By the way, if you have any special needs that are left over from the aftermath of the storm, please call the church office and let us plan to help you. Leaving a lasting legacy. That's the biblical financial planning seminar. It's going to be led by Pastor Brian Giaquinto next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, October the 12th, uh, 5 to 6 p.m. in room 185. He'll be going, going over the latest information on wills, trusts, pensions, insurance, and so forth. Uh, the way it's designed, you can grab your supper and fellowship hall, take your tray of food with you to the session. Two groups will be meeting this Sunday, rescheduled. Uh, they'll be meeting at 5 p.m., Discipleship Training, DTP, and also Mom's Moments of Grace. So you who are involved in those know where you're supposed to be. Also, October 15th, foot care is canceled. And then 11 days from now, we'll be having a baptism service. So it'll be Sunday evening, October the 16th at 6 p.m. here in the worship center. We have several folks to baptize. They'll be giving their testimonies. And there will also be some praise and worship time. And when it's done, we'll gather back in Fellowship Hall for some free snacks. There will be a memorial service for Grayson Brown, age four, who passed away last Saturday. That will be Saturday, October the 15th at 10 a.m. here in the Worship Center. Uh, there will be a church-wide reception afterward. And by the way, there's a meal train in the works, and if you would like to be involved in providing a potluck-type food for that, please contact Cindy Carswell. She is uh, putting all that together. Uh, Grayson battled with major health issues throughout most of his young life. Uh, so please plan to support the family, be here for that, and also provide some prayer support for the parents, Joss and Victoria, and also uh, little brother Wesley and the grandparents, Dave and Val Brown, and also who lived in the home with them, Grayson's uncle, Michael. Our call to worship tonight is from Isaiah 24, verses 14 and 15. These are some instructions that we should probably heed even tonight. It says this, they raise their voices, they shout for joy. They cry out from the east and the west concerning the majesty of the Lord. Therefore, glorify the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we seek to glorify you tonight. We thank you for who you are, for what you stand for, how you work in our lives, how you are sovereign over all things. And we pray, Lord, that you would See us in this service tonight. See us to the extent that we work hard worshiping you. May the preached word penetrate our hearts and enable us to better understand you and what you're all about. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Church family, it's good to see you here tonight. Um, hope all is well with you and your family, loved ones. Uh, we've come to worship the Lord. Amen. We've come to lift his name up on high. So why don't you stand to your feet and let's do just that tonight.
sing all praise to him. All praise to him, whose power and heart, the love of God within our hearts, the spirit of all truth and peace, the fount of joy and holiness. To Father, Son. Aren't you thankful for that truth, church? the fame. 
Father, all my earthly aim in time will turn to dust. Let me learn that loss is gain for those who know your Seated. it. One of my favorite Song of Grace songs right there. What a joy seeing that together. I want to encourage you to put um, Grayson's memorial service on your calendar. Uh, maybe some of you um, don't know them, maybe you're newer to the church, but I promise this is a service you don't want to miss. Uh, Pastor Rick and Hayward and I had the privilege to spend several hours with Josh and Victoria um, Tuesday, I think it was, uh, yesterday. Uh, man, it's one of those meetings that you wish the whole church was there to hear their hearts and experience somewhat of that suffering, but yet their response to what God has chose to do. Uh, but I do think, and I, I'm confident, that you're going to hear that on a week from Saturday. So uh, please put that on your calendar. There's not a lot of services for little ones because it just doesn't happen that often. And so it's challenging in many ways, but yet God is showing himself glorious through this. And Josh and Victoria, their faith is strong. I am so proud of them. Uh, I walked out of that meeting, uh, Hayward and Rick and I, just very encouraged by those two. And they're going to be okay. They're going to hurt for a while. And our job is to love on them, bring food, care, have conversation, pray, surround them with deep love. Um, but God's going to sustain them. and It's going to be part of their testimony for the rest of their lives. And So please put that on your calendar. I'm sure there's people coming in from all over for it. It'll be a very full service. But um, be a part of that. I promise you'll be very encouraged. Father in heaven, we thank you that you gave us your son so we can cling to him. Even in the most difficult of times, winds blow and the seas rise, the loss of loved ones, we have a savior who is an anchor. And we can cling to him. And we find such joy there, even in the day deepest sorrows, the most trying times, we have an anchor to cling to, Lord. And we're so grateful for our glorious Christ. Lord, thank you for worship music that draws our attention to Jesus, to his truth of the word, Lord. And we thank you for this church, Lord. Continue to provide for us, protect us, Lord, as we cling to your son and his word. And may we continue to go forward loving you and loving one another. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to Numbers chapter 5. I was ready to preach this last Wednesday, and the storm decided to not let us do that. <laughs> uh, so I've been kind of dinking around with it for a week, and uh, it's a challenging text to say the least, but uh, I think you're going to see the glorious Christ in it. Again, that's my, always my goal to preach the Old Testament and see Jesus in all things, but uh, this is a unique passage. Um, uh, maybe like you, you've, I think I'm similar. When I looked at the book of Numbers, I looked at the very beginning of the book and saw kind of some of the mundane numbering. And because you glance at it, you don't study that in depthly. And you, you're looking forward to all the narratives when they leave there at Sinai and they start to make their way to the border. And then, then we know they reject God there and then they're sent out into the wanderings. And we look forward to those because there was a lot of lessons there. And, a lot of amazing things happen in that. But 
I hope, like me, you've begun to engage with this book, even in these early chapters. Uh, just think about some of the things we've seen so far. God has numbered the warriors of the nation of Israel. They now know how many fighting men they have. They are in a hostile, hostile environment. <laughs> Their neighbors do not like them. Uh, all of a sudden, there's a new nation right in the middle of them. And that's going to be a difficulty. And so God numbers their warriors and begins to uh, get them uh, placements around the tabernacle. We saw that, how he placed all the tribes and why he placed them there. And then we saw the numbering of the Levitical tribe uh, through their divisions of their family there. And they numbered all the men ages 30 through 50. And all of them were given certain responsibilities in the, the assembling or disassembling and the traveling of uh, or transport of the tabernacle. And, and then we marked the importance of God's holiness because even as they disassembled, disassembled that tabernacle, how God was protecting the holy things and no one could look even upon the holy things. Today we're going to actually see holy dust. <laughs> Everything that's in the presence of God is holy, even the dust. Uh, we'll see that the, this evening. Um, and, and how that was taken down in such a way that no one could look upon the holy things of God except the high priest. And what connection to Christ we saw there even in that. And we saw that orderly arrangement of the camp as they prepared to march. And we, we marked that it's not difficult to see that God is a God of order, right? And, and even uh, how he arranges our lives, our, our, the church in the new covenant age, he's given order to it with leaderships and, and every member having a role and, and every, every body part is equal to one another. All of this is orderly as, you know, as, we, as we think about this, as we march through the wilderness of this world, headed to the kingdom of God, God has given us order. And when we get out of that order, whether that's marriage or, or the way the church operates, and we find all kinds of problems, don't we? And so it's important that we learn these lessons as well. So God has a place for everything and everyone. And as you and I walk with him, work for him, even war for him, because that's what we see this nation going to do, we learn to be worshipers in a very strange world that's fallen, isn't it? When we come to chapter 5, we now see um, some instructions giving the concern, uh, concerning the cleansing of the camp. Um, the camp God wants holy. And these three different aspects of this chapter are going to highlight the cleansing of that as, as they serve this holy God uh, who must be approached in purity. Leviticus chapter 11 there we saw where God says, I am holy, be holy because I am holy, right? He, he makes that statement. It's carried across into the New Testament in First Peter chapter one And there Peter says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the lusts that which were yours in your ignorance. And so in a sense, if we look back at the Leviticus, God saying, look, you are my children. Be holy because I am holy. Not like you were when I came and got you out of Egypt. I have now made you my people. And so Peter goes on to quote Leviticus 11 and says, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourself. Be set apart, right? Hagias, word we get for holy or sanctified. Be set apart for me. The Bible teaches that all the way through the scriptures. Your mind, I purchase you, be set apart for me. And so we see this theme running throughout uh, the Bible. And as we think about God's character, it's immutable, right? It doesn't change. It is, he's the same God of Numbers chapter 5 as he is the God of the New Testament or New Covenant era that we are in. And so he is holy, and his approachability hasn't changed. You must be perfect. You must be holy to come into his presence. That's, that's a big statement, isn't it? And we'll, we'll remind ourselves how, why, and how we got holy, right? And how, how we can get into his presence is fascinating. That's the gospel, right? And, it, and it, it reminds us that God has done such a divine work to get Scott into his presence, just find joy that God would do such a thing. So all things, all people who come into the presence of God must be holy. And not some temporary holiness. This is permanent, right? 
This is a wholesale change of our souls for all of eternity. So it is a great work. And all of this, of course, is a foreshadowing of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at three thoughts today. We'll break this passage down into three different um, sections here. Number one, a holy God in the center of the camp. Look at verses one through four with me. We won't read all the verses, but I'll be highlighting some of them as we go through. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, command the sons of Israel that they send away from the camp every leopard and everyone having a discharge and everyone who is unclean because of a dead person. You shall send them, excuse me, you, should send, you shall send away both male and female and you shall send them outside the camp so they will not defile their camp where I dwell in their midst. And the sons of Israel did so and sent them outside the camp just as the Lord had spoken to Moses, so the sons of Israel did. Well, the key statement there is in verse 3. Notice that it says, where I dwell in their midst. That's the key here. You have the presence of a holy God who can't tolerate impurities. And a lot of people struggle with these passages. All, all this whole, uh, Numbers 5 is a really difficult one for a lot of people um, uh, who don't understand what this is teaching and, and don't understand the holiness of God and don't understand the finished work of Christ to bring us in this presence. Um, it is teaching that anything that is not holy, not perfect, cannot be in the presence of God. And that's the way we will enter heaven ourselves. And so people struggle with these passages, but we are dealing with a perfect holy God who does not tolerate impurities in the people he saves or in the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, right? Everything had to be unblemished, right? Now, in the text, there's three forms of impurity. Just real quick, you see this. First, you see leprosy. He dealt with leprosy uh, in the law in Leviticus 13 and 14 uh, extensively there. We had a great discussion about that. Um, but if anyone had this dreadful disease, they were to be sent out the camp because they were unclean. You can go back and listen to that series on, on thir uh, chapter 13 and 14 in Leviticus. The second one of impurity was any bodily discharges. Uh, again, we dealt with that in Leviticus 15. Those were challenging texts. There's a lot more detail there. Um, but according to Leviticus 15, those with discharges were to be considered unclean for seven days. But here, it's interesting here... There seems to be a, a, a focus on the presence of the Lord in this preparation of this tabernacle coming down, being disassembled, transported, and reassembled. And so there seems to be this heightened awareness, even a stricter standard of the things that are around God, God's temple here where he dwells. The third form of impurity here, as you'll notice, was contact with a dead person. And again, Leviticus 21 deals with this in great detail. We looked at that. Um, as we look forward, uh, we'll get to Numbers chapter 19. You'll see uh, when we get there that such a person who comes in contact with a dead person is to be unclean for seven days, and, but not shut completely out of the community like they are in this moment right here during this disassembling of the tabernacle. But here in chapter 5, there's this temporary expulsion and i think so much has to do with as he prepares to bring down the curtain to lower the veil in a sense and disassemble that and so there are uh certain people that cannot be in the presence of god during that time however as we ponder these first few verses i think about the holiness of god and and the the restrictions of man. You know, when we think about this, we marvel at the grace of God that any of us can have, have a relationship with God, right? I think that's what makes us worshipers. And I think the doctrines of grace and, and uh, reformed theology heightens the understanding of the damning conditions of sin. It, it makes us realize that we have, we have nothing uh, in and of ourselves, there's nothing deserving of ourselves to be in the presence of God, and yet God makes a way through his son. And, and this just comes out over and over as you study these Old Testament passages. And, and in fact, as I studied this, this last week, I marveled that he would give me such miraculous grace that I can come, in a sense, into the most holy place through Jesus Christ and at <clears throat> any time speak with him. At any time, at any place, at any moment, the damned one who has been 
cleansed and now declared holy and blameless can now speak with him. Now, look, we know that sick people and deformed people and people with discharges, people contact with dead people, they were considered unclean and could not be in the presence of God. And you can imagine in this time, in this ancient world, they were kind of like the disciples in Mark chapter 10. They will say, well, well who can be saved? Right? And remember in Mark chapter 10, Jesus says, uh, yeah, with men, that's impossible. Remember this statement? But with God, it's not. And again, this is, this is all looking forward to what the Lord is doing uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ. All of this is temporary. It's a picture of something greater to come. And we know that only Aaron, the high priest, could approach the presence of God. And think about that. We are now all high priest. That's why we believe in the priesthood of the believer. We don't need somebody else to get me into the presence of God. Jesus Christ has brought me in. I now have the right to sup and, and to be with my Father. I can be in his presence at any moment. And so we are believer, high priest, who walk into the presence of God, don't we? And so we're reminded that, that because there is no deformities or any of these other ailments in the presence of God, it reminds us that God had to do something amazing. He had to remove the damage. He had to remove the blemish. He had to remove the stain of sin so we could be in his presence. And, we, and, we, and that's what this is about here. As harsh it may be, if you don't know the Bible very well and you don't know Jesus Christ and understand the gospel, you would look at this and go, well, that's kind of mean. I mean, you know there's other passages where you crush testicles and deformed people. I mean, they're gone. And if you don't understand what God is saying of, of the picture of his holiness and all that pointing forward, most people just walk away from the passage and go, I don't want your God. But that's not what this is telling us, right? It's telling us that God has a way to come to him, a way to be unblemished and undamaged. It's interesting as you think about this, a lot of this is around the priesthood as well. And the priesthood family, if they had deformities, as we saw in Leviticus 21 through 22, they could not serve. And so it's everyone who's in the presence. And though that priest family was taken care of, they enjoyed the sacrificial benefits, they got food and all those things. Everything that is in the presence of God is holy and perfect. And I hope that encourages you if you're a believer if you're not, you should be greatly fearful. You should fear. Because there's no other way than God to declare you holy through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and not your own works. Well, regardless whether you are of the tribe of Levi or of the tribes of Israel here, the command is focused on the holiness of God and his approachability right here. So anything that comes before God has to be holy. Now, what a beautiful picture this is. I'm already leaning towards these things. Uh, Jesus is often referred to, in the, particularly Acts, as the Holy One of Israel, right? He, all those passages that refer to the Holy One of Israel all point forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. And even in Peter's great sermons in Acts chapter 3, verse 14, as he rebukes the Pharisees, he says, but you disown the Holy and Righteous One. And you ask for a murder to be granted. And so all of these sacrifices, all of this cleansing, all of this holy protocol um, here of moving people away from the tabernacle, all of this points to the Holy One who could come into a tabernacle. And think about this, as Hebrews 9 says, he can come into a tabernacle not made with hands of men, right? But he comes into a heavenly tabernacle, right into the very holy holies of God and brings us through his own blood for a final atonement. And so Jesus' ministry point, point this out in many ways, right? When we study the ministry of Jesus, we, we see his holy, perfect, high priestly position in so many ways, even before the cross. And, and let, me, let me just, as we kind of talk about, there's deformities and there's different things that can't be there. But look what Jesus does. He, he constantly is touching people who are unclean, and allowing unclean people to touch him. A bleeding woman. This woman, how she even got to him without yelling unclean, unclean, and all the things she should have been doing was a defilement of the law. And the Lord allows her to touch him. I mean, we have example after example. He has not only the bleeding woman, he has the deaf, the mute, the blind, the leper. He, he's in contact with these people. 
He's dealing with the dead, right? We see him raise people from the dead. That would have been eliminate him from so many things. And so he's, he's teaching that he can take the most uh, outcast of people and make them clean. It's a demonstration of what he's going to do through his finished work on the cross to bring people like you and I, defiled, deformed, spiritually deformed people in the presence of God. He does that. And you just find so much joy that God would take a wretch and bring us into his presence through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think there's any better instruction than the parable of the Lord Jesus Christ when he calls for the great banquet. And the people he invited don't come. And he condemns them. And then he says to his servants, go out there and gather the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Right? He, all the people that, that couldn't come to the tabernacle, who couldn't become close. Christ in that parable says, that's who I'm bringing in. The ones who know they don't deserve to be in my presence, I'm bringing them in. Nobody gets saved who thinks they deserve to be saved. You just don't get saved. You think you deserve to be saved? You'll never see the kingdom of God. It is those who say, I have no right to be in the presence of the Lord. I am spiritually deformed. And he makes us whole, doesn't he? It's all because of this finished work of Christ. And so true worship comes when we recognize that we only walk with God because he made us holy and blameless. I love Colossians chapter 1, verse 22. Yet he who has reconciled you, changed your position... You were spiritually deformed, dead in your sins. He did this in his fleshly body. He became flesh for us through his death. He did this in order to present you, brothers and sisters, you before him, holy and blameless and above reproach. The wretches, the deformed spiritually, now are made perfect and holy who can stand before God. And this little set of verses here (laughs) makes you think forward, doesn't it? Send away from me, verse 3, the male and the female. Get them outside of the camp. Well, that's mean. No, that's reality. That's who we were. We were put outside the camp. And Christ, through his finished work, has brought us into the very, not just back into the camp, we're in the Holy of Holies with our Father. Second thought, um, here, a pure camp that was right with God and man. And he begins to deal with another aspect here. Look at verses 5 through 10. I'll read these quickly. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel when a man or a woman commits any of the sins of mankind, acting unfaithfully against the Lord. Very important there. And that, and that person is guilty. Then he shall confess his sins which he has committed, and he shall make restitution in full for his wrongs and add to it one-fifth of it, And give it to him whom he has wronged. But if the man has no relative to whom the restitution may be made for the wrong, the restitution which is made for the wrong must go to the Lord for the priest, besides the ram atonement by which the atonement is made for him. Also, every contribution pertaining to all the holy gifts of the sons of Israel, which they offer to the priest, shall be this. So every man's holy gift shall be this, whether any man gives to the priest, it becomes his. Um, what we're dealing with in verses 5 through 10 is dealing with the, the questions of guilt and restitution in the camp. Uh, again, Leviticus 6 really dealt with a lot of this uh, in a more fuller way here. But the subject is about the damage done to someone who doesn't have anyone for this money, this restitution, to go to. And so it's clear that there's been a sin against someone, it's, and it's clear, and I think very, very important here, that the sin is against the Lord. So, so if a, a, a Jewish uh, Israelite sinned against another Israelite, God wants it clear that that sin was against him, even though it was against somebody else, and there's a restitution that has to follow true repentance is the idea here. And so what is added here from this Leviticus, from Leviticus 6 type passage is that what do we do with the funds of the wronged of the person who was wrong and when they give those funds and there's no family to give them to and so the restitution is given to the priest here and that's the idea of verses 5 through 10 i think this ordinance from god provides though another illustration of the way in which god's people were to be kept pure in 
in his divine presence there. And I think there's twofold aspect here. One, you notice there's a confession in verse 7, right? This is a confession. I've sinned against this, this other Israelite and I've sinned against God. This is putting things right with God. I'm confessing my sin. This is the first stage. And then notice there's a second stage of this. There's this restitution. It's putting things right with a fellow Israelite. Somebody says, oh yeah, I sinned against God. Never deal with a person. Right? Yeah, I'll, I'll you know, go say a few things, a few deep knee bends, drop a few coins in the fountains, and I'm good. But they never deal with the person they have offended. And so this is a great biblical principle, isn't it? And both are necessary, right? God says, sees this as necessary for the purity of the camp. You need to be right with all men and you need to be right with me because you want to have a holy relationship with me. It includes the rest of the nation. And so, look, he's trying to have a nation of people who are right with one another. That's unusual. <laughs> I mean, you just look at our nation. Nobody's right with anybody. There's such a big, growing divide. I, I don't Politically, racial, you name it. It's just growing greater and greater. And for a nation of God, he wants his people connected. And I think well, that's why we long for the kingdom of God so much. And he's the, as he rules and reigns and the connection and the rightness between people, that God's people will be so beautiful, won't it? There won't be any problems ever between us. Wouldn't that be beautiful? And, and see, this is what God's after. He's after that purity in the camp, and he's after that with us as well. And so when we think about our own sin and how we come before God, we, we do confess things, right? And Christ forgave us of all your sins. Again, back to Colossians chapter 13 and 14, but I want to show you that he also paid your restitution here. When you were dead in your transgressions, transgressions and your uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven all your transgressions, transgressions, all of them. Having Now listen to this, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of degrees against you. He restores you. You had a list of restitution that would... That, would be forever, right? You remember the parable when the guy you know, owes the man money and, and he owes so much money he could never pay it off and, and so he goes to shake down all the other people to try to get money back and, and you just begin to realize there's no way he can pay the debt and the king lets him off, you know, lets him go with that and yet he goes back and extracts more money from people. That's not how the Lord does this. The Lord takes care of our sins and our debt. And I love what it says, which were hostile against us he has taken them out of the way and has nailed them to the cross. And so when we confess our sins, the Bible says he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us of all of our unrighteousness, right? And so genuine repentance uh, will desire to be right with God and man. That's, that's, that's what the Bible does. Look at Luke chapter 19. Here's a great illustration before the cross. Luke 19, 1. Luke 19, 1, he, Jesus, entered Jericho. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> There's a real connection here with Zacchaeus and Jericho. But anyway, he entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through the way. You can, I mean, the imagery is just amazing here, right? you got a short guy, a lot of crowd. Everybody's trying to see Christ. This, this isn't a few people lined up along the road. This is masses, right? If you're short enough, you could just get your way through, right? We pushed our kids in front of the parade up there. This is, this is a massive group of people. And so he climbs a sycamore tree so he can just to see Jesus. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry down and come for today. I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. That is so different than the religious rulers of the day, right? The last thing they did is received him gladly. And most people don't receive Jesus gladly, Right? Well, he's a good guy, right? But do I really need him? Verse 7, when they saw it, 
they all began to grumble. Well, the we is there as the religious leaders and a lot of uh, religious people saying, he has gone to be a guest of a man who is a sinner. See, the reason that they don't love Jesus is they don't know or believe they're sinners. You won't love Jesus till you know you're a sinner. You just look at everybody else, you go, you know, when you tell your testimony to somebody, man, I'm a wretch, God saved me, they kind of look at you like, dude, I don't know what you did, but man, you, I'm glad you got your Jesus thing on. They just, they don't get it, do they? When you talk about Jesus and that he saved sinners, they, they just don't get it. They connect sin with bad things, but they're not, of course, doing it. And that's what they did here with, with Christ and Zacchaeus. Verse 8, Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, look at this. Half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. He goes way, by, way past the fifth. He wants to, he's, he's, in a way, he's confessing. Look, if I've done any of these things, I, I'm repenting of them. And the proof of it is I'm going to give back this money. And Jesus said, today salvation has come to your house. Wow, what a statement. The Son of Man has only come to seek and to save that which was lost. He didn't come to seek and save those who thought they were found. And I think Zacchaeus knew this Old Testament principle as you flip back to chapter 5. And he knew that restitution followed repentance. I think this, we see the same thing in the New Covenant and the New Testament. You inflict damage on somebody, you should seek to make restitution. But I think it, we see the heart of it more, right? A passage like 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 10 through 11 says, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance without regret, right? So true, godly sorrow of our sin leads us to repentance, right? Leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death, meaning that just, there's no fruit that ever comes from the sorrow that the world has, right? For behold... What earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you. So Paul's now talking to the Corinth church. We, we're, in, we're in 1 Corinthians. We know how, how messed up they are at this point. But he says, true godly sorrow has produced some amazing things in you. What vindication of yourself, what indicate, indication, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. Isn't that interesting? Paul is marking that confession, repentance will bring fruit. You'll, you'll, you'll avenge the things that you wronged. I don't know how many of you, when you got saved, you started going around and talking to people. Hey, man, I, I owe you an apology. I didn't need to do this or that. I mean, you realize you, you've done something. Your life was not where God wanted it, and you want to make things right. He says, in everything, you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. And so these Corinthians were truly repentant. And they, they came with a determination to make everything right. In everything, they wanted to make it right. And so shedding a few tears is one thing. But, but making things right, making restitution, demonstrating repentance in God, not in a works place. We have to be careful of that. I mean, we have to be really careful of those things, right? Um, okay, I've got a list of things to demonstrate on repentance. No, no, it's got to flow from your heart, Right? And so a few tears don't do that. True repentance is demonstrated. And be careful because you, you might start thinking of somebody right now or you might, we got to think about ourselves. Is there, when, we, when we've done something, is, is there, is there uh, is something we need to follow up on? And I'm talking husbands, wives, close relationships. No, sorry, you know, I don't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> That's not Repentance. Need to work through things. Need to set everything right. And see, this is what God doing. This holy God is in amongst this camp, and He's residing uh, amongst uh, a sinful people, and He's He's helping them realize what it means to have a holy God among you. It isn't just a sacrificial system. It works from the sacrificial system out to every brother and sister, every neighbor, every person. That's what walking with God is about. Third, the purity of the bride. Uh, this is one that is challenging. Um, but I think 
If you bear with me as I work my way through this, you'll be encouraged. Look at this verse 11 and 12, and then I'm going to refer to many of these other verses. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, If any man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him. We'll we'll stop right there um, uh, and start to begin to set the scene. But first of all, I want you to know God always judges immorality. Uh, This nation of Israel is surrounded by pagan nations, now think about this, that have intertwined sexual immorality with religion. And God wants no part of that. And the camp of Israel was to be pure. And, And immorality had no place there because the true and living and holy God was dwelling in the presence. And so immorality uh, has always been a clear indication of those who, those who stay in immorality is a clear indication of those who don't belong to God. And, and even the New Testament uses terms that, that help us understand they don't inherit the kingdom of God. Now think about this. The Old Testament was all looking forward to the kingdom of God. And when Jesus showed up, They weren't looking for a savior. They weren't looking for someone to die for them. They were looking for a king of the kingdom. They they had everything wrong, right? Because when you're not a sinner, you don't look for a savior. Um, You just want to win, and so you need a king. And so uh, all of the terminology that we have in Scripture is about the kingdom of God. So in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, or adulterers, or effeminate, or homosexuals, or thieves, or covetous, or drunkards, or revilers, or swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And this beautiful term, we never want to leave this verse out. And such were some of you, but you were washed, and you were sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God. Ephesians chapter 5. For this you know with certainty, wow, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousies, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, things like these, of which I warned you that of these, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. They understood this. And, that, and that's been consistent, right? And again, we're not shoving certain immorality things as higher and greater sins. We just know they carry such great consequences. So as I look at Numbers 5, I believe there's something bigger going on in this text. I think it's pointing to something grander, and we're going to get to that. But first I want to just give you an overview of this process that God lays out to unveil hidden sin, or, be careful you don't miss this, or innocence. This text is about not only revealing sin, but also revealing innocence. So let me just kind of blow down through this just a little bit. I'll be giving you verses to kind of look at. In verses 13, there's really two separate cases here. There's, there is, in verse 13, is presented with a situation where a woman has sinned in immorality. Uh, a, a man other than her husband has slept with her, and, and, and it can't be proven. There's no hard evidence right here. Verse 14 is another situation where the woman may be guilty or may be innocent, but her husband has great suspicion. He has a spirit of jealousy. Verse 15, the jealousy and suspicion, suspicious husband brings his wife to the tabernacle, to the, to, to the priest, and he also brings an appropriate grain offering with him. Verse 16, notice the priest takes the woman into the courtyard of the tabernacle and essentially puts her in the presence of the Lord. Verse 17, the priest takes a water pot, probably uh, water that was deemed holy uh, ceremonial water, and he mixes it with the dust of the tabernacle. And verse 17, I just got stuck on it today. I was working on this and I thought, God, even the dust is holy in your presence. I mean, if you don't think he's serious about holiness, that he cares about dust. And so this holy dust is mixed into the water here. Notice that. Verse 18, the 
the priest would return to the woman and her hair would be let down and it's a sign of mourning and humility. And the grain offering would be placed in her hands. Verses 19 through 22, the priest would, while holding the water in his hands, would have her take an oath as he recited the immunity to the curse or the consequences of the curse. Notice at the end of verse 22, the woman would agree to the oath with a double amen. We know the word amen means I agree, I accept. Verse 23, the priest would write down the curses and then he would wash them away with this ceremonial water. And by the way, um, you always wonder where the Catholics kind of get all this holy water type stuff. This is, this is one of the passages. Totally out of context. Totally abused. Verse 24, the woman drinks the water. Verse 25 and 26, the priest take the grain offering from the woman and they burn a portion of that on the altar before God and the woman drinks the water again. In verse 27, the water reveals that she is defiled because of her unfaithfulness to her husband and it brings a curse where her abdomen swells or her thigh wastes away. There's all kinds of medical views on this that I read and I won't bore you with of what was actually happening physically to a woman who truly was sinful in this case. It, it, it's unclear whether it makes her um, barren. I, I think that's the idea there, that she becomes barren because of this. In verse 28, if the curse does not reveal these ailments, she's proclaimed clean and she's free from any charges and now can conceive children. So that's why we think possibly it eliminated her from having children. And then the law of jealousy is rehearsed in verses 29 through 30. And then verse 31, this statement is proclaimed and read. And oh man, do the liberals not like this one. Moreover, the man will be free from guilt, but the woman shall bear her guilt. Now, Certainly there's a larger picture here going on that I really want to get into, but I want to do it through asking some questions. First, why is the man not subject to the same text? Right? Why is he not getting the same text? It's a good question, isn't it? Second, is the Bible teaching a double standard? There's a lot of people that don't like the Bible. Don't, they, they find things like this. They don't understand Christ's finished work. They don't understand the holiness of God. And so they see this and they go, look, the Bible hates, God hates women. I don't want anything to do with God because of stuff like this. So is the Bible teaching a double standard? Could a husband be guilty of immorality and a spirit of jealousy come upon a wife? That's a good question, right? I was just thinking of questions as I was trying to answer this myself. And the answer is absolutely to yes to all of these things, right? Right? The man could have been subject to this test, and, 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 and there is not a double standard to the Bible here, right? Because we know that throughout the law, there are these severe consequences for men or women who are caught in immorality or adultery, and they're stoned to death over and over. We find it. Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, all teaches the same truth. We've already cited several scriptures in the New Testament that take those who refuse to repent and turn from immorality and show they have no part of the kingdom of God. So clearly there's no double standard here. In fact... There is a case that can be made that this test was there for her innocence and to exonerate her. Because a husband falsely accused her of something. And so there's a protection there as well. So there's no double standard. You commit adultery in the Old Testament, you're going out and going to be under a pile of stones from your own family. This is why Joseph was very careful what he was doing with Mary. He knew what could be done. If she turns up pregnant, someone from not from him, a child from not from him, she knows what's coming her way. Possible death, at least prostitution and booted out of the family. So, Mo, so Joseph is very careful with Mary. And he's pondering how to put her away quietly. And then the angel appears to him. Now, this text really highlights the clear revelation of God's word of the sanctity of marriage, too. I like that. God's serious about our relationships with each other, particularly in our marriages. 
He does not want them defiled. What he has given to you um, is to be protected and guarded and seen as precious. That intimate relationship that you share with a spouse is a gift from God. It's such a gift that he tells everyone else who's not in marriage not to have a part of it. And if you, if you stay in that type of lifestyle, you'll, have no, you'll prove you have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. So it's something that's super special to God, this intimate relationship that he gave husbands and wife. And I think that's highlighted in here. I think what's also highlighted here is the seriousness of sexual sin. It carries such a heavy consequence. And again, Christians get blamed. Oh, you guys are against, you know, you're always against talking about sexual sins. Because oh, yeah, we know the consequences of them. And then maybe some of you could speak to this more than others. You can lose everything real quickly. I mean everything. I know men down to a studio apartment that owned massive businesses because of sexual sin. It, it's serious. And I, and I think that's, that's one of the thoughts here. But then let's ask the question, so why is only the woman tested in Numbers 5? I think that's a fair question, right? Why is she on trial here and not the man? Well, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see that God's word always refers to the children of God as the bride of God. This is the bigger picture. God's setting a standard of his bride. And he will exonerate her if falsely accused, but he wants his bride pure. And that's what this is all pointing to. The book of Isaiah speaks of the eternal covenant that God has with his bride. Isaiah 54, 5 and 6 for your husband is your maker. Isn't that interesting? Whose name is the Lord of hosts, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. For the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like a wife of one's youth, when she is rejected, says your God. When Israel is under judgment, the prophet Ezekiel speaks of their unfaithfulness as a bride and he says in ezekiel 16 32 he says you adulterous wife who takes strangers instead of her husband as you drop down into the new testament you begin to see that the new testament illustrates cry the church as a picture or, uh, the wife as a picture of the church in fact the word we have for church is always used in the feminine tense isn't that interesting it's never masculine. It's always feminine. Anytime you find the word church in the Bible or assembly or uh, that we word we get ecclesia from, uh, it's always in the feminine. It's always teaching us that there's a picture here of a bride. And then when you get to the end of all things and God gathers all of his people into one great family and he brings us before him, Revelation 19 7 says this, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready so there's a bigger issue here isn't he he's using this situation to teach the purity of the camp the purity of the nation the purity of god's bride and as you go back and look here in numbers five you begin to see this term spirit of jealousy it's an interesting term in verse 14 and so in this larger picture of this passage we're reminded that god is a jealous god right and he's not going to share his bride with another. You, you watch where this whole marriage thing's going. I mean, the polygamists are just waiting in the wings. They're taking this thing down a trail, and the polygamists are going to go, ha! bestiality, you name it, nothing's going to be off limits where they're taking this thing. And God says, no, no. I'm not going to share my bride with another. Not idols, not images, nothing. Nothing is going to adulterate. My bride will not adulterate themselves against me. They're my bride. He's, he's showing that. And he has this jealousy. Even after he gives the first command, Exodus chapter 25 and 6, you shall not worship them nor serve them. Talking about idols, images. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting iniquity on the fathers of children of the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. And so here the Bible tells us he's a jealous God. It's not a sinful jealousy like a human experience, right? Our jealousy, uh, we got to be really careful with it. I think there is some 
purity to, to I, I don't know if we could use the word jealousy, but uh, yeah, you touch my wife, uh, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> She's mine and I'm hers. I think there's, there's a beauty to that. But this jealousy that most humans have is sinful. That's not what God has. He's a holy God dwelling among sinners. And, and we are brought into his presence to dwell with him. And he refuses. He refuses to allow people to come to him not his way. You're going to come his way or you don't come at all. You're removed. And when you think about this in that greater context, if we refuse to confess our sins, God will expose it. Again, because he's a holy God and all must be holy in his presence, even in this temporary sacrificial system. And as you look at this as a big hole, and this woman sitting there is a picture of the nation. And if she thinks she did something in secret, God is going to reveal it. This nation thinks they can tiptoe off and get involved with the gods of the other nations. He's going to expose it. If they're falsely accused, the Lord is going to protect them and exonerate them. There's a bigger picture here of the nation here. Unfortunately, Numbers 5 has been abused at times. Women have been poorly treated in the church even. So we have a God who has a holy jealousy here. He loves his children. He loves his bride. And he wants our love in return. He, he's jealous for you. He's jealous for me. He desires us to give, uh, give him our time, to give him our affections, not give them to the things of the world. And, and the illustration here is, is immorality, right? A woman gave what belonged to another man she, in, in a very worldly way, gives that away, and he's using that to say, no, you don't give anything. That all belongs to me. Your devotion is to me. And that's what we are in our marriages, right? We reflect the gospel. Husbands, love your wife like Christ loved the church who gave himself up for her. Wives, be devoted to your husbands. Submit to them as unto the Lord. It's this beautiful picture of the relationship of God and his bride, Christ and his bride, right? So number five, Numbers chapter 5 is teaching something so great. Look, we're his people, we are his sheep of his flock. All others are thieves and robbers who seek to steal the purity of the church. And so this is why we get a little excited when somebody worms their way into the church with some false doctrine. What they're trying to do is do something very impure. And elders rise up and fight for the purity of the church. And you should too. Somebody comes sneaking around teaching Christ plus something, we're on it. Because we won't let that happen to Christ's bride. Well, in Numbers chapter 5, I believe God's using, again, thinking about this, he's using the beautiful role of women to teach a great truth. Just as a wife is to be a one-man woman, we, we know that passage in 1 Timothy 3 where the elder is to be a one-woman man, I, I think this is the idea here. The wife is to be a one-man woman. So the nation was to be a one-God nation. They failed, didn't they? You get into the major and minor prophets and you just see, blah. And you, and you hear terms that are gross almost of their adulterating against the groom because they didn't keep that covenant, that one-God nation. And I think God is demonstrating that if this nation commits infidelity, it will be exposed and the consequences will be devastating. And again, God, look at ladies, God uses you in such phenomenal ways. The role of biblical womanhood is constantly repeated throughout the Bible to teach us how we live under the lordship of the Jesus Christ. What a beautiful thing teaches us great lessons that mankind has to hear. That's why we're not going to give up on it. We're going to keep uh, 
teaching men to be uh, godly biblical men and women to be godly women, biblical women because the world needs this. And it's not going to be hard <laughs> to show difference between them, is it? We're going to be freak shows before soon, aren't we? Turn with me to First Peter. I, I, First Peter chapter three. I'll end with this. I started looking through several passages today on clear instruction to women, but thinking about the church. Now, let me be clear here. In First Peter chapter three, the context is the role of a wife. And the context is suffering. Verse 21 of chapter 2, you've been called to this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his steps. And so whether it's the wife in verses 1 through 6 or verse 7, the husband, the context is suffering in the same way. So I want to be clear, I, I'm, I want, I'm not trying to abuse this text in any way, I just I, I want to make an application here. And, I, and if we believe that Ephesians 5 teaches that, uh, that the, uh, the, uh, the wife uh, resembles the picture of the church and the husband re resembles the picture of Christ, if that's true, I started thinking and reading through several passages and I kind of landed on this one. So think with me, again, the context in, the Bible's teaching is about wives and what a godly wife looks like here. But let's think about the church, because she, she we're supposed to be reflecting her. In fact, ladies, you teach the church how we are to conduct ourselves under the lordship of Jesus Christ. In the same way, you wives or church, be submissive to your own husband, to your Lord Jesus Christ, if it's the church. So that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of these church members, right? So I'm, I'm thinking this way. Because that's what wives do. That's their role is to send, show this glorious picture of a church that submits to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Notice if they would observe us as a church in our observe our chaste and respectful behavior. Well, what's happening in the progressive church today? Oh, hey, you know, these passages on homosexuality are really not for us today. That's a, no chaste and respectful behavior. There's no church discipline going on when people are hopping around bedrooms. Nobody wants to deal with that stuff. But here the Bible tells this gal who reflects the picture of Christ to be chaste and respectful in behavior. Notice she is not to adorn themselves with external stuff, right? Church, we, we're not about the external. Ian wanted to take this building? Great. We met outside Sunday. We'll do it again. <laughs> the church met on the lawn this last Sunday. That was the church. And, and, and so we're not dressing ourselves up. We're, we're not having bright and shiny things, right? We're not braiding our drapes. <laughs> putting gold and putting chairs where the hierarchy of the church sits. But look, the church should have a hidden person of the heart, right? This should be the heart of us all. An imperishable quality that's gentle and quiet in spirit, which is precious to God. And again, I, I hope I didn't offend anybody. I know the passage is about wives, but if a wife reflects a picture of the church, we can learn from this, can't we? And, I, and the more I sat and looked at this today, I thought, Lord, what's going on with your church today in America? They're not really about winning anybody but themselves. They're not submissive to the lordship of Jesus Christ and his word. They're more about external, what they look like, how much money can get put in the plate, how many seats can get filled, how we can dress things up on the outside. They're not concerned with the heart. And so the preaching is all about topics and moving from one thing to another and making people feel happy and feel good about themselves in your best life now. It's not what the Bible's about. And it's not what the church is about. And so I, I trust you'll never look at Numbers 5 the same when you read this very difficult passage. There's a bigger picture. It's a big picture. Christ. God is jealous for his bride. And he won't share her with anyone else. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for Numbers chapter 5.
our cursory read, Lord, we kind of go, ooh. But then we just dig a little deeper. And we ask questions and we think about the whole of Scripture. And we think about the relationship of God's people with himself and we begin to understand there's an illustration going on here. And if we go a little farther, we find that the ultimate price was paid for our eternal purity. It was Jesus, the Son of God, his own life. And so we've been made pure. And so we are to conduct ourselves as Paul writes in Colossians, to live ourselves in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. We're to please Him. Father, I thank You that we have so many women in this church who live pleasing lives to You. I am very grateful for them. I watch their lives and I see women dedicated to glorifying God. Not always in the most easy situations. And so I praise you for them, Lord. Thank you for biblical womanhood. We need to learn. We need to watch. We need to live that way as a church. And Lord, we thank you for the role of biblical manhood. You've given us the greatest example in the Lord Jesus Christ who would lay his life down. Accused, mistreated, misunderstood, hated, but still laid his life down. That's the gospel. And so, Lord, I pray you would strengthen us and motivate us to be people who live out the gift of holiness. Help us live out the gift of holiness in all of our relationships, Individually and corporately, Lord. And we know when falsely accused, you will exonerate us. Because we're your bride. And you're jealous for us. And so, Lord, we thank you. Lord, bless this evening. I pray you give everyone a safe trip home. Sweet rest tonight. May we start again serving you as your bride. In Jesus' name, amen.